Okay, uh, we're off to uh, chapter 16, uh, second to last chapter here of the season. Uh, so we're going to talk about acid and bases uh, in this chapter. So let's get going on it. So talk a little bit about sort of acids and bases in general. Acids, uh, for uh, example, like vinegar is acetic acid, like we used the other day there in some titrations, I think. Um, citric acid we have in lemons and some other obviously fruit uh bases are typically characterized by a bitter taste and a slippery feel a lot of bases are like soaps and also things like drain cleaner and those type of things are really bases uh bases are sometimes referred to as being alkaline uh, and the word alkaline really does mean that basic and for the most part, a lot of our kind of strong bases come from group one and group two on the periodic table. A reminder, those are our alkali metals, our alkaline earth metals. Uh, so a lot of those guys in group one and group two that are have hydroxide in the actual formula, things like sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, um, are where a lot of our strong bases come from, as we'll talk about. Pretty much if you take kind of group one on the periodic table and group two and kind of like where lithium is, come down to like potassium, go over and then down. A lot of these guys here uh, that have hydroxide with them uh, are, are strong bait. Um, <clears throat> and very commonly, uh, a lot of strong bases will actually have uh, that OH minus in the actual formula itself. So sort of an early definition and work done on acid and bases was done by Arrhenius here. He did a lot of work with electrolytes. If you remember, electrolytes are substances that when they do go into solution, they break apart into ions. Uh, those ions can conduct electricity. If you remember, there's a couple of different types of electrolytes that we talked about. There are strong electrolytes, uh, which 100% break apart in solution into ions. Uh, there are weak electrolytes, uh, which basically stay together, but produce a few ions. These are usually those guys with those arrows, as we've talked about, and we will see again, kind of heading in both directions. Strong electrolytes are really guys that kind of have one-way arrow. So strong acids and strong bases are really strong electrolytes. Uh, weak acids and weak bases, as we'll talk a little bit about, are really weak electrolytes. So he did a lot of work with it, and he defined an acid as something that's able to produce hydrogen ions in solution, while he described a base as something that's able to produce hydroxide. So in terms of an equation or reaction, pretty much if you see H plus on the product side, or you see kind of OH minus on the product side, Again, free by itself, um, you had either an acid or a base sort of solution. And that's what we're talking about here. Uh, we're talking about in the solution, the hydroxide or the H plus are freely floating in the solution. So they're not attached to anything. They're just kind of floating around freely in the solution. And the amount of each of those guys in the solution will determine, as we'll talk about, whether it's acidic, basic, or perhaps neutral in certain situations. One really important thing in terms of acid and base chemistry is some of the different sort of uh, representations of acids that we do see. Um, H plus, which is the hydrogen ion, uh, and H3O plus, which is the hydronium ion. This is the hydrogen ion. They are essentially equivalent. Uh, they're basically the same thing. They represent the acidic part of the solution. Personally, myself, I, I use H plus most of the time. Uh, so wherever I put H plus, you pretty much can put H3O plus and it's basically the same thing. That goes both in equations and also formulas as well. Uh, a lot of books will use H3O plus rather than H plus. So again, they are basically the same thing when you see it, again, in equations and also formulas along the way. Um, <clears throat> One of the reasons why we get, say, H plus versus H3O plus has to really do with whether or not we sort of include water 
when we're talking about an acid, really go. is in water. Really, when the acid goes into water, you get H plus or H3 plus, depending on your equation, how you write it. So for an example of that, if we took something like hydrochloric acid, which is a strong acid, and we just want to show this strong acid breaking apart in solution, because remember, when it is in solution, uh, pretty much it's all ions. So it's 100% these guys. You have none of the HCl units still together. And that's a perfectly legitimate way of representing an acid, sometimes referred to as dissociating in solution, basically breaking apart. You could also write this equation where you have the acid and really you have the water involved as really like a base. And what happens is the acid will send the H plus over and you will get H3O plus when that happens and Cl minus which is basically an equation that shows the same thing. It's just the acid breaking apart in water. So in this case, we included the water here, and that's what generated H3O+. If you leave the water out, which is perfectly fine to do with acids, uh, you will get just the H+. And again, both of those things are pretty much the exact same thing. <laughs> Any questions on that there? So uh, here again is an example. By the way, hydrochloric acid dissolved in some water will make them hydrochloric acid. I remember that as we talked about naming, we talked about how to properly name acids, and it really involves whether or not there is oxygen, right? So if there's kind of no oxygen, like what we have here with HCl, and by the way, when we write acids, they also get the aqueous symbol next to it to indicate that it is an acid and not a gas. That is our hydro starting type of name. So hydrochloric acid, right? Remember that if it is a oxy acid, which means it has oxygen, it will contain a polyatomic ion and those do not get the hydro. Uh, we just based off of the polyatomic, that is nitrate, A-T-E, which means this would be nitric acid as opposed to H-N-O-2. NO2 is NO2 minus, which is nitrite. This would be nitrite trus acid, right? So if it is yes to oxygen, there should be no hydro, but really the ending of it is based off the polyatomic ion name, uh, like we talked about when we were doing naming. Yeah. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> so it was a really good sort of step forward in acid-based chemistry, but like I said, he did a lot of work with electrolytes and really strong electrolytes. And a lot of times uh, the bases that he focused on had hydroxide actually in the formula. And although a lot of strong bases do have hydroxide in the formula, not all bases will actually have hydroxide in its formula, but is able to produce it. For example, if we looked at sodium hydroxide, which is a strong base, it will basically 100% break apart into a sodium ion and hydroxide ions in solution, which means obviously it is able to produce a lot of hydroxide really, really quickly, because frankly, all it needs to do is go for a swim. So that's why it's considered a strong base. It goes for a swim, it'll break apart. Your solution now has a bunch of free hydroxides floating around, which is gonna make it really basic probably. Now, if you take something that's more of a weak base, like ammonia, NH3 does not have hydroxide in it, but when it reacts with something like water, uh, what's going to happen is it will take an H plus there from the water and it will produce NH4 plus and OH minus. So here, the ammonia is still considered a base because it has the ability to still produce hydroxide in solution. It is a much weaker base than say something like sodium hydroxide, so as I mentioned before, sodium hydroxide just needs to go for a swim. Here, the ammonia has got to go find some water, do a little bit of a reaction. So it's still able to produce some hydroxide, but nowhere near what, say, uh, sodium hydroxide would it be able to produce in solution. So again, that's why it's more of a weak acid. And as we talked about before, there are our reversible sort of arrows, which indicates that it's a weak electrolyte and also a weak base in this particular case. <clears throat> 
questions on that there. <clears throat> So that brings us to really a more uh, general definition of mass and bases, and probably the definition of mass and bases that you'll use the most as you proceed through chemistry. And that is the Bronsted-Lowry model of mass and bases or the Bronsted-Lowry definition of mass and bases. And in the Bronsted-Lowry definition of an acid and base, an acid is a proton donor and a base is a proton acceptor. Uh, which brings us back to our H plus and another sort of version here of what we call that. That is also hydrogen ion. It's also a proton. And that is because hydrogen has one proton, one electron, and no neutrons. In order for it to become positively charged, it has to lose an electron, which leaves it just a proton. So in acid-based chemistry, it's very common that H plus is referred to as a proton. Also the hydrogen ion and H3O plus is another version, which is the hydronium ion. So there's kind of three different sort of representations. Sometimes people will use an acid-based chemistry for an acid, basically, proton, hydrogen ion, and hydronium ion. They basically all represent the same thing. It's really sort of the acid part of the solution. A proton donor is obviously somebody that gives away an H. It's also really important, and where most people screw up is the charge part of it as well. So, as it gives away an H, it's not just an H, but it is an H plus. And if somebody accepts it or gives it away, it will affect the overall charge of those things. So obviously if you lose something that is positive, you become one more negative, right? Because you now have more electrons than protons. And obviously if you gain something like H plus, you become one more positive. So it's really important that the charges of everything get adjusted as sort of it takes place. There is sort of a consequence, for example, a process Lowry definition. And we can look, for example, if we want at our HCL example, we saw a second ago, and I will include the water here. And as I drew uh, a second ago here, the acid will donate its H plus over to the base, which is the water in this case. The result of that there, again, is we're going to get H3O plus and Cl minus. Now, what happens as a result of the Bronsted-Lowry definition is we will have acid and bases on the left-hand side of the arrow, but they will create partners on the right-hand side of the arrow that are related to each other. So this HCl, as you could probably see, is related to the Cl minus on the other side, and the Cl minus is what is known as the conjugate base. Well, the water on the left-hand side is related to the H3O plus, and this is what is referred to as the conjugate acid. So just for orientation purposes there, left-hand side of the arrow, reactant side of the arrow is where you find your regular acid and bases. All your conjugate guys, conjugate acid, conjugate bases are found on the right-hand side of the arrow. Now, a really important thing to know that these two things are related to each other as either an acid in its conjugate base or a base in this conjugate acid is the only difference that there can be is pretty much this H plus. That's the only difference. So it has to be just one H plus difference only for things to be related. So since the acid gives it away, the conjugate base will have one less H plus as you go from left to right. And as the base accepts it, it will have one more H plus as you go there. And that H plus is obviously the one that was donated in this particular case. So in order for these things, again, to be related to each other, that is the, absolutely the only difference that you could have. You cannot have any more difference than that. And if you do, they are not. Uh, acid conjugate base pairs, even if they kind of look like they come from each other, um, they are not going to be pairs if it's more than one H plus. Any questions on that there? Yeah. H3O plus is a conjugate acid in this case, yeah. It is the conjugate acid to water, which is the base. It's basically what uh, basically develops when it accepts H plus. Water accepts H 
the result of it accepting H plus, it then turns into H3O, which then is a good acid, which is this part. Other questions? <clears throat> So as I mentioned before, we do have this sort of general reaction that occurs. And HA, by the way, is just a generic formula for any type of acid. It could be like HNO3, HCl. It is a, what is sometimes referred to as a monoprotic acid. Monoprotic means that it has basically one hydrogen that it could give off. Um, once again, here, our water going to act as our base and as it sends that over, we will get our partners that will sort of pair up here. And again, our conjugate acid here and our conjugate base there. And there's our example that we just did there, our HCl to Cl minus and our water to our H3O plus acid conjugate base pair. And again, it's just that one H plus is going to be donated. And here is the drawing of it again how basically hydronium ion is produced going to take this h send it over there to the water the water will accept it and that will produce our h3o plus which is our hydronium ion All right, let's take a look at an example here of identifying some of these here. For each of these, decide if they are acid conjugate base pairs. Let me add one here to it, maybe HSO4 and SO. Okay, let's take a look. So, hopefully, uh, from what we've been talking about, you know that again, that is the only difference that there should be between those two is just one H. Plus. Uh, so if we look at the first set here, um, it is just a difference of one H plus. Uh, you could either uh, take the H plus off of there and you get this guy or vice versa. Put the H plus on the guy on the right and you should get the other guy and you do in that particular case. Looking at number two here, um, there is a difference of one H plus, but there is also a difference of an oxygen, which obviously the first one does not have. So they are definitely not related to each other because there is definitely a difference of more than just one H plus in this case. Uh, look at the next one here. They are related to each other. If we take off the H, we're left with an HPO4. And once again, when we lose the positive, we become one more negative. So again, the charge is really important here. Uh, we'll end up as HPO4 to minus. <clears throat> and lastly here, same thing. This one would be a pair. As we get rid of the H, we're left with NO3. And once again, this is neutral. So we should become one more minus as we lose it in this case. That means in the original question, it looks like uh, we're good. Now, what about this guy? Are they pairs? These two are not pairs because the difference here is two H pluses. Yeah. So, because even though they may be related to each other, they are not conjugate acid base pairs because it is more than one. And that is because something like this, which is sulfuric acid, this is what is referred to as being a diprotic acid, as it has two hydrogens that it could give off. By the way, when you have multiple hydrogens to come off, they do come off one at a time. Uh, so in like a stepwise fashion. So in this particular case, what would happen is the H2SO4 would drop off a hydrogen and make HSO4 minus. <clears throat> 
then that HSO4 minus would then lose another hydrogen and make sulfate in this case. This is the stepwise dissociation that occurs. And if you add these together, what would happen is uh, this guy here and this guy would cancel each other out since they're on opposite sides of the arrow. And you'll get the overall reaction that we sometimes look at, which is H2SO4 will drop two hydrogens and sulfate. But again, those two are not related to each other because this difference in terms of is a blank screen. There you go. This guy here and this guy here would be related to each other as that's only a difference of one H plus. And then this guy here and this guy here would be related to each other as that's just a difference of one H plus. But again, if we try to kind of jump from directly this guy to this guy, that is two H pluses. So they do come off one at a time. Another example of something that comes off multiple times is sometimes there is something like a triprotic acid, which is something like phosphoric acid, which actually has three hydrogens that will come off. And again, they do come off in a one by one sort of fashion. So the first thing that would happen is that guy would lose a hydrogen. Next thing would happen, this guy here would lose another hydrogen. And remember, as you can see here, the charge changes as it loses a hydrogen. And lastly, this guy here would lose the third hydrogen in this case and make phosphate. Overall, if you added all those together, basically phosphoric acid would give away three hydrogens. But again, it does come as a step-by-step -step fashion where this guy and this guy would be partners. This guy and this guy would be partners. And lastly here, Uh, that guy and that guy would be partners. So again, um, each of them do come off one at a time. Is it easier, you think, to get rid of the uh, first hydrogen or the second if there's more than one or the third? It is much easier to get rid of uh, the first hydrogen. Comes off a lot easier. After you get rid of the first hydrogen, you become negatively charged and try to rip off something that's positively charged. So it becomes increasingly harder and harder to do so in tri diprotic acids or triprotic acids. Uh, so for example, if you did have a triprotic or a diprotic acid, pretty much the majority of all the hydrogen would come off in the very first step. So the very first step is where you pretty much will get most of that hydrogen off. By the time, for example, you get to this step, barely any of it is going to come off because it's much, much harder. You got minus two charge at that point. It's going to keep that hydrogen ion kind of in there tight. Any questions on any of that there? <clears throat> All right, then for each of these here, we're looking for what the conjugate base would be. And while you're at it, we'll add this guy here, HCO3 minus. Why don't you do the uh, conjugate base for that? And why don't you also do the conjugate acid for that? Starting with HCO. Okay, let's take a look. Uh, so once again, hopefully you should know at this point, it's all about the H plus. And the key here is, should you put it on or should you take it off? That's sort of the hard part of it. So it's good to think about sort of what we talked about earlier, which is just a general way we think about Bronsted Lowry sort of definitions, acid plus a base means on the other side, you have a conjugate acid and a conjugate base. And the relationship is acid on one side is related to the base on the other, base on one side is related to the conjugate acid on the other. So in this particular case, it asks us to write the conjugate base, which would be this guy, 
So if we just kind of follow it backwards, what we know is everything that we're looking at here is basically an acid. So we just got to go by the Bronsted Lowry definition of an acid, which is it should donate the H plus. So that means in this case, we want to actually get rid of an H plus in each of these cases. So that's what we want to do. So if we get rid of the H here, we're left with one H and an S. Remember that we also lost the positive part of it, which means we then become one more negative. So that should be H S minus. Here, once again, we're going to lose an H, which means we're left with an S. And the positive means we become one more negative. So already started at minus one. So we should end at minus two. Here, we're going to lose an H, which will give us NH2. Once again, here we're neutral. So one more negative would be NH2 minus. Lastly, here we would lose one of the H's, gives us HSO3. And again, that positive charge will then take us to a negative there. Any questions on that one there? <clears throat> Taking a look at the one I added, uh, we're going to look for the conjugate base and the conjugate acid. If we did the conjugate uh, base first, this would then be acting as an acid, which means we should get rid of the H, and we should end up with CO3 again, one more minus, minus two. Now, in this particular case, if we were looking for the conjugate acid, that means if we go backwards, in this case, it will be acting as a base, which means it's going to accept the H plus. So we're going to actually put an H plus on there. And that would then give us H2CO3 plus one and minus one. Actually, we guess be accepting the H plus, however you want to do it, uh, would give us H2CO3. <clears throat> Any questions on that? In this particular case, this guy right about here acted both as an acid or a base. And there are certain things that can act as either an acid or a base. And those guys are what are referred to as being amphoteric. So an amphoteric substance can act as a acid or a base. Water is also amphoteric. It can act as an acid or a base. A lot of times in chemistry, the ones that can kind of do that sort of act either as an acid or a base are things that have a hydrogen, which means it could give it away. And typically, a lot of times, we'll have a negative charge. So a lot of those guys that have sort of that hydrogen and a negative charge do actually have the ability to kind of go both ways. Uh, so for example, if you had like hydrogen sulfate, which is this, also kind of do both things depending on the situation. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> Question on uh, Bronsted Lowry acid and bases here. Okay, then let's talk a little bit about acid strength. Uh, so acids, as we've been talking about, are really electrolytes. And we can have reversible reactions and we can have reactions that really do only go in sort of one direction. Uh, so once again, if you do have a strong acid, that is pretty much gonna be a one-way arrow where everybody's gonna break apart into ions. Remember that for an acid, H plus is always the cation. Uh, if you have more of a weak acid, that is where we're going to see those reversible arrows happen, as we see here. And, you know, you could have something like HF, for example, hydrofluoric acid is a weak acid. When it breaks apart, it will break apart into H plus and F minus. Again, that should be a reversible arrows heading in both directions. <clears throat> and again, something like hydrochloric acid, as we've been talking about, is a strong acid, which will, again, 100% break apart into our ions here. So how do we know if something is sort of a strong acid or a strong base? Uh, for the most part, there are really good for you to know, especially if you continue your chemistry journey. So some strong acids are hydrochloric acid, nitric acid, perchloric acid, sulfuric acid, 
hydrobromic acid and hydroiodic acid. Kind of like your big strong acids. I would say probably in most cases, if it is not one of those six, it's probably a weak acid It probably in most cases. Um, our strong bases, as we talked about a little bit earlier, again, kind of that group one, group two with hydroxide in the formula. So again, kind of starting like lithium down to potassium, hang over there to calcium and down. Any of those guys with hydroxide gonna probably be strong, like again, sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide are very common sort of strong bases uh, where you find those guys. Uh, some weak acids, like I said, pretty much anybody outside of those, um, like HF, HNO2, you know, just some weak acids. HF, HNO2, HCN, and so forth. Um, some weak bases, probably the most common weak base that you come across is the one that we talked about earlier, which is ammonia. That's a very common sort of weak base. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> Again, knowing those strong acids will uh, be really helpful for you, especially if you get to 1B or you take 1B. Uh, depending if you need it or not, uh, knowing those guys will make a lot of things really easily easier. And here as well, it will kind of help to know them. So obviously, if the forward direction predominates, uh, we will have our strong acid, which will completely dissociate or ionize. And again, that's just a fancy way of saying it's going to completely break apart into ions. And you will have really that one-way arrow, as we talked about. If the reverse reaction predominates, you will have a weak acid, which is a weak electrolyte. And you will have those arrows heading really in both directions in this particular case. Now, there is sort of a relationship between uh, the acid and the base and sort of his conjugate partner on the other side of the arrow. So depending on sort of where the conjugate partner comes from, if it comes from a strong acid or a strong base versus a weak acid or weak base, there is sort of an opposite relationship that occurs between those things. So if you have a strong acid or really even a strong base, uh, its conjugate partner will be relatively weak. Um, and opposite of that, if you have a conjugate acid or conjugate base that comes from a weak acid or weak base, its conjugate partner will be relatively strong. So what do I mean by that? And again, if you go on to 1B, you'll talk more about this. But basically, when we talk about sort of a conjugate partner being relatively strong, it means that it does have the ability to continue to react with something like water, which is obviously in solution to begin with. And because of that, it's able to kind of affect the pH. So what I mean by that, if we looked at our hydrofluoric acid, which again is a weak acid when it breaks apart into H plus and F minus, this is our weak acid. This would be our conjugate base. And because this F minus really does come from a weak acid, it is going to be relatively strong, which means it will go through a particular type of reaction, which is it will then react with water, which is in the solution to begin with. And when it does react with water, it will actually accept an H plus, and it will produce HF, which is where it came from, and it will produce hydroxide. So this is barely our conjugate base. And because it's a base, it's able to produce hydroxide and continue to re uh, react on. Obviously, as it would produce hydroxide, it will cause really that solution to become basic because it's basically generating um, hydroxide. Now, this guy, which is technically a base that came from a weak acid, although it is a base, it's nowhere near as strong as something like sodium hydroxide. Because again, sodium hydroxide, all it needs to do is go into the solution and it's going to 100% break apart into Na plus and OH minus. And it will produce a lot more of this OH minus than, say, this guy would produce. 
So when we say it's strong, what it means really is it's able to continue to react with water through a reaction, which is known as a hydrolysis reaction, which is a fancy way of saying water is involved. And basically because it's able to produce hydroxide, uh, it will really affect the pH, it will make it really more basic. Now, something that comes from a strong acid or a strong base doesn't have the ability to do that. So for example, if you have HCl, which is a strong acid, it will break apart into H plus and Cl minus. Now this Cl minus comes from this strong acid which means when the Cl minus tries to react with water, uh, there's really not going to be a reaction that's going to occur. So it's not going to react with water. It is sometimes referred to as being neutral because it really won't react with water. It's just kind of hanging out there, not doing very much uh, to affect the pH of the solution. So anything that is derived from a strong acid or strong base, pretty much a neutral sort of guy, it's going to be relatively weak, not going to continue to react. Anything that comes from a weak acid or a weak base will continue to react with water, which is in the solution to begin with. And those guys can have an effect through the hydrolysis reaction of either making the solution more acidic or more basic, depending on sort of the reaction that's taking place. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> so uh, there's our list of uh, strong acids. And again, we added some to it and we talked about our diprotic acid a second ago. So we'll go over that. Now, a couple of different types of acids. Uh, sometimes our acids are oxy acids. Maybe, maybe it's going to catch up. Maybe, there we go. Looks like the nice delay. All right. So, our oxy acids, uh, much like the name implies, is acids that basically have oxygen. So, something like our nitric acid, uh, which we might have drew when we did some Lewis structures. And by the way, in case you sketch it, it does look something like this, by the way. Was that? It? It's got the delay for dramatic purposes. All right. Oh, there we go. All right. So uh, our nitric acid looked something like this. And by the way, it, it is this bond right here. It is that hydrogen that basically is the hydrogen that comes off that makes it an acid. And that bond right there is a polar bond that we talked about, negative right towards the oxygen, positive towards the hydrogen. And that is why that hydrogen can come off, right? There's kind of a difference in the charge. Electrons are going to be more towards the oxygen as it's more electronegative. And it's going to weaken that bond, allow the H plus to basically come off. A organic acid will have a carboxylic acid group and our friend acetic acid is an example of that. And uh, it looks something like this if we drew it. And this entire group here, by the way, is the carboxylic acid group in organic chemistry. And once again, it is actually this hydrogen right here that is the one that will come off. And again, it's that hydrogen that will come off because it is part of that polar bond where the electrons are separated and going to weaken it. Remember that all the hydrogens that are sitting here, you may be tempted to think maybe one of those are the ones that are going to basically the carbon hydrogen bond, which is not of electrons. So it's actually going to hold the hydrogen a little bit tighter polar bond that we have happening over there where the OH is. And that's why it is that H that comes off from the OH bond uh, that makes it an acid. <clears throat> Any question on that there? Okay. So let's talk a little bit about water and sort of its effect on solution and whether or not it's acidic or basic or neutral. Water, as we talked about a little bit earlier, is amphoteric and it can act as either an acid or a base. So we saw both of these reactions as we've gone through here, water acting as an acid, which means it will send its H plus over there, producing hydroxide and water acting as a base, which means it will accept the H plus and will produce H3O plus, which means it's an acid. 
once again, if you ever see an equation and you see OH minus by itself on the product side, it's going to be basic. And again, if you see H3O plus on the product side or H plus, it's going to be acidic. Water can even react with itself, which is basically what's happening in water. One of the waters is the acid and one is the base. So in this example here, we'll just say it's going that way. And the result of that is it will make H3O plus or OH minus a solution. And really that H3O plus or OH minus, um, the concentrations that you have of each of those things will determine whether or not it's acidic or basic or neutral. And really this is sort of the acid part of a solution. And this is really like the base part of a solution. This will set up, although it's not fully drawn out, those are the reversible arrows there. And this is will set up what is referred to as be reaching equilibrium. And when we talk about something that reaches equilibrium, sometimes people have a misconception about what that means, that it is like equal amounts on both sides, which is kind of what the word equal sort of means. But that's really not what it's talking about here. Because this is a reversible reaction, there is a forward direction where it goes from reactants to products. And there is a reverse direction where it goes backwards from products back to reactants. And when it does reach equilibrium, what it means is the rate of the forward reaction where it goes from reactants to products will equal the rate of the reverse reaction where the products go back to the reactants. Basically, because they're going back and forth at an equal rate, you don't end up oftentimes with the same amount on both sides, but you lock everybody into place because just as quick as it goes one way, it comes back the other way. So whatever concentrations these things were at that particular point, when it reaches equilibrium, they basically will stay at those concentrations. And that's important because it gives us an expression that you could write for something that's an equilibrium, uh, which is referred to sometimes as K, which is the equilibrium constant. And the equilibrium constant is sort of a value that we could use whenever we have any type of reversible reaction that is taking place. And there is a specific one uh, for water, and it is what is referred to as being Kw, which is the equilibrium constant basically for water. So let's take a look at that here. And this is sometimes what is referred to as the autoionization of water. <clears throat> and the equilibrium expression that we get is what is referred to as Kw, and that is the concentration of H plus times the concentration of OH minus equals a constant value for the most part at 25 degrees, which is one times 10 to the minus 14. We could use H plus here, or we could use H3O plus like it is here. Once again, they are interchangeable. There is a relationship between these two things as the concentration of H plus increases, the concentration of OH minus decreases and vice versa. As one goes up, the other goes down basically. The brackets mean concentration and pretty much they mean molarity, which is moles per liter. So uh, when you see those little brackets around something, that is the concentration of it, and it's pretty much the molarity of it. So you could think of the H plus concentration as the acid part of the solution, and you could think of the OH minus concentration as the base part of the solution, and you could compare both of those concentrations if you know them and determine if the solution is acidic, basic, or neutral. So. If obviously your H plus concentration is larger, it would be acidic. If your OH minus concentration is larger, it would be basic. And actually, they equal each other, which means they both will have a value of one times 10 to the minus seven. Uh, they would then would be a neutral solution. So a neutral solution is when we got both of those concentrations equal to each other. The nice thing is it is the same calculation, which basically you take one times 10 to the minus 14 and you divide it by whatever concentration is given to you. And it's really important here to make sure you use your, otherwise it's gonna be a long chapter for you, yes. So make sure you use that exponent button, that EE button, that EXP. You definitely don't wanna be doing any weird way of entering numbers in scientific notation in your calculator.
because we will later add on logs and inverse logs and you will be off for sure. So make sure that you definitely use your exponent button here. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> All right, let's take a look at a few here. So each of these are separate problems. So calculate either the hydroxide or the H plus concentration and then determine, is it acidic, basic, or neutral? So take a few minutes there, see what you come out, grab your calculator, and make sure you know how to punch it in properly. And again, use your exponent button. Okay, let's take a look. Uh, so really on all these, we're going to use that KW relationship of the H plus concentration times the OH minus concentration equals one times 10 to minus 14. Again, you always have this number. It's most likely not gonna be given to you in a problem. So you just gotta know you have that number sort of available to you. So here uh, we do have the OH minus, uh, the H plus. So we're looking for the OH minus, uh, which would be our one times 10 to the minus 14 divided by our H plus concentration of 3.4 times 10 to the minus four. Again, making sure you use your exponent button, one exponent button, negative button 14 divided by 3.4 exponent button negative and four. Going to give us a 2.9 to the minus 11. And you do need a molarity on that as it is a concentration in this case. First off, any questions on the calculation? Is this acidic, basic, or neutral? Which one is larger, the H plus or OH minus in this case? The H plus is to the minus four. The OH minus is to the minus 11. The H plus is larger in this case. It is acidic. Yeah. A reminder that when you look at a negative exponent, the smaller number is the larger number because negative four means you go four places to the left and put zeros. Negative 11 means you go 11 places to the left and fill it in with zeros, which makes it a much smaller number. So negative is kind of important here in terms of the exponent. Taking a look at the next one here. Uh, again, we're going to get the OH minus will be our one times 10 to the minus 14 divided by our 2.6 times 10 to the minus eight and one to the minus 14, 2.6 to the minus eight. Gonna give us uh, 3.8 times 10 to the minus seven molar. Once again here, H plus, which is the acid part is to the minus eight. OH minus, which is the base part, so the minus seven. So the OH minus is actually larger, which means that this guy would be basic in this case. Yeah. Continuing on, uh, here we have the OH minus, but it's really this. Plus is equal to times 10 to the minus 9. Going to give us uh, 1.6 uh, to the minus six, looks like times 10 to the minus six molar. In this case, our OH minus is to the minus nine, H plus is to the minus six, which means that should be larger. So this guy will be acidic in this case. And lastly, here, looking at the last one of this example. Uh, again, we're going to do our H plus, and that's going to be our 1 times 10 to the minus 14 divided by 8.1 times 10 to the minus 3. Going to give us a 1.2 times 10 to the minus 12 molar. In this case, minus 12 is much less than minus 3. Uh, so this guy would be basic as well. Any question on any of those there? By the way, keep that in mind as you are answering these questions of is it acidic, basic, or neutral? There is only one answer to that question, not multiples. Yes, that's very common. Sometimes people in this chapter will say it's acidic and then in the same problem go, it is basic as well. I never had anybody do three, acidic, basic, and neutral, but acidic and basic sometimes commonly do. So it should just be one answer to that.
Again, if you're finding yourself off a little bit on your answer here, it's probably the way you're punching it in with your exponent button. And again, if you're not sure again where your exponent button is, come see me, we'll find it again, yes. All right, so let's take a look at one more here of this type. Uh, we'll skip that. Let's just do what is the OH minus concentration and is it acidic, basic, or neutral in this case? <clears throat> Okay, so like the previous ones here, we're going to use KW. So that's going to give us an OH minus is equal to our one times 10 to the minus 14, which again is a constant value for us pretty much. Even though it does change, but it will be pretty constant for us. Uh, divided by 2.8 times 10 to the minus 5. Again, making sure we use our exponent buttons. gets us 3.6 times 10 to the minus 10 molar in this case. Any question on that calculation there? This then would be if we compare our acid part, which is to the minus three, to our base part, which is to the minus 10, uh, the acid part definitely is larger in this case. Yeah. Any questions on KW? <clears throat> All right, then let's talk about uh, the pH scale, which is uh, a good thing to do. We'll skip that one since we just did it. So the pH scale is an important sort of calculation, and it really is oftentimes what we use to determine whether or not something is acidic, basic, or neutral. It runs from zero to seven to 14. Less than seven is acidic. Above seven is basic. And technically speaking, because the concentrations equal each other, and it equals one times 10 to the minus seven, uh, the pH there at seven is neutral. And we will stick to that in lecture here, just so there's no understanding. It's seven is neutral. If it's a little bit above seven, then it's slightly basic. If it's less than seven, it'll be slightly acidic, unless it's almost like dead on seven. We're going to not call it neutral. Seven is sort of your center point. As you go towards 14, you become more basic. As you go from seven towards zero, you become more acidic. And it really is the pH scale that you should look at to determine whether or not something's acidic, basic, or neutral. There is a way to calculate pH, which is the guy on the bottom. It's not negative. That's just from PowerPoint. So that is the equation here, the pH. And it tells you in the actual name, pH means you need the H plus concentration to calculate it is equal to minus the log of the H plus concentration. Now, depending on your calculator as to how you punch this formula in or all the rest of them in for the rest of this chapter, if you have a display calculator, you should hit the negative button, the log button, and then type in your concentration using your exponent button, most likely. If you have a non-display calculator, this formula and the rest of them, most likely we will see, you need to actually work backwards, which means you should start with the number, you should hit log, and then you should hit the negative button. If you're not sure what type of calculator you have, hit log, and if it says log, congratulations, you have a display calculator. And if you hit log and it says error, congratulations, you have a non-display calculator if that is what happens there. So if you have a display calculator, pretty much all the formulas we're gonna talk about here, you just punch it in exactly the way it's written. If you have a non-display calculator, you pretty much need to kind of go backwards in all the formulas to punch it in correctly. Obviously using uh, your exponent button, obviously if it's something in scientific notation when you punch it in. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> so let's talk about an important thing, which is significant figures and pH. The number of decimal places you should have in a pH type value, some type of value is calculated using the log, should be equal to the number of significant figures in the concentration value. So it's important to remember here, we're actually going from six and then uh, next from decimal places back to sig figs going in the opposite direction. So why don't you give this a go? The H plus concentration is one times 10 to the minus five. Calculate the pH here to the proper digits. See what you come up with. Again, if you have a display calculator, type it in exactly the way it's written. Make sure you use your negative button, not your subtract button. And if you have a non-display calculator, go the opposite way. Okay, let's take a look. So again, we're going to use obviously our pH equation. We're going to put it in, making sure that we either go forward or backwards, depending on our calculator, making sure we also use our exponent button here when we push this number in, 
And let's just start with the number. You should get five, hopefully, staring back at you on your calculator. I hope. So should this be five? Should this be 5.0? Should this be 5.00? 5.000000. Feels like a lot of zeros, even though it may look a little scientific. -y. All right, which one is it? Five, five point zero, five point zero zero. It is five point zero zero here. And that is because the concentration here has two significant figures. That means that we should end up not with two significant figures but we should end up with two decimal places. And that would be the correct way to report that uh, based on it. When we go backwards, which we'll talk about, uh, if you're going from decimal places back to sig figs, going in the opposite direction. And to finish up, this is obviously going to be acidic in this case, as the pH is less than seven. Yeah. Any questions on that there? All right, seems like a good stopping place there for today.